Hola, ¿qué tal? ¿Cómo están? Mi nombre es Fernando David García Culebro, miembro del Centro Internacional de Investigación Otras Voces en Educación. Como resultado del trabajo que hemos venido realizando desde el año 2020 en la alianza conformada entre el CIPCAL, el MAEC de México, la CEIP de Argentina y OVE de Venezuela, en esta oportunidad presentamos a ustedes la participación de nuestro querido Peter McLaren. Y quiero comenzar presentando. tal? ¿Cómo están? Aunque es ampliamente Mi conocido, conocido, me gustaría Culebro, hablarles un miembro poco del de Centro Internacional de Investigación. Peter McLaren, otras es profesor, profesor, educación, filósofo como resultado del trabajo que hemos es considerado como uno de los principales propulsores de la conformada en crítica. El sus obras de México, poseen un potencial crítico hacia el capitalismo en todas sus expresiones. En esta oportunidad, los aportes teóricos de McLaren la han trascendido la... su pensamiento a diversas regiones alrededor del mundo. Sus aportes permiten el descubrimiento de nuevas formas de abordar el proceso educativo. McLaren es autor y coautor de varios libros y monografías. Su libro, La vida en las escuelas, ha sido nombrado como uno de los 12 escritos más significativos a nivel mundial en el campo de la teoría educativa, la política y la práctica, por un panel de, de expertos reunidos por la Escuela de Ciencias Económicas y Sociales de Moscú. Hoy tenemos el gusto de dar voz a este gran ser humano, para que nos presente su nuevo libro, La Guerra en Ucrania. A través de este video nos comparte algunos resúmenes muy breves sobre su libro. Nos dice que no quiso esperar a que la guerra se desarrollara aún más. Pensó que era importante sacar algo relativamente rápido, así que comenzó a escribir artículos sobre la guerra. Justo después de la invasión, él quería sacar eso lo más pronto posible. Y logró hacerlo a través de una serie de artículos y lo reunió y agregó material nuevo y perfeccionó sus pensamientos. Nos cuenta que a veces tuvo que cambiar algunos de sus puntos de vista que tenía antes de la guerra y que le gustaría compartir algo de esa experiencia. Asimismo, envía saludos a todos y a todas quienes ven este video. Es importante mencionar que Peter señala que no escribió este libro como un trabajo académico, sino es más bien una obra del periodismo crítico. McLaren Narra cómo en la invasión de Ucrania, por parte de Rusia, millones de ucranianos inocentes han sido desarraigados de sus hogares, miles de civiles han resultado muertos y heridos, y cada día más de 100 soldados ucranianos mueren en combate. La guerra ha precipitado una crisis alimentaria mundial que afectará a millones y la hambruna amenaza a amplias zonas del mundo, dice Peter. Pero sin más preámbulos, dejemos que él nos comparta lo que ha escrito en su libro. Well, good day. I want to thank Luis Bonilla for kindly um, suggesting that I introduce my new book, The War in Ukraine and in America, um, today. And I'd like to share with you just some um, some some overviews, very brief overviews. Um, about my book, the motivation that um, gave me a kind of an impetus to write this at this particular time and not wait for the war to develop even further. I thought it was important to get something out relatively quickly. So I started writing articles um, about the war uh, right after the invasion and it is an invasion, an invasion of Ukraine by, uh, by Russia. And um, I wanted to get that out relatively quickly. And I managed to do that through a series of articles. And I put those articles together and I added new material and I um, refined my thoughts and sometimes changed um, some of my viewpoints that I was holding prior to the war. And I'd like to share with, with you um, some of that experience. And um, I want to say greetings to everyone in Venezuela and uh, whoever uh, might be watching this video. And again, I want to offer another thank you to Luis Bonilla for giving me the opportunity to discuss my new book with you uh, this afternoon or this morning or this evening or whenever you happen to be 
watching this video. I'm going to read some uh, summaries about my book um, as a way of um, giving you some idea about its range and scope. And I basically wrote the book to pose problems in the manner of my late mentor, Paulo Freire. Uh, I offer very few solutions, but I raise a lot of issues. And I, th I think these issues um, need to be raised. And I didn't write this book as an academic work, but more, uh, more as a work of critical journalism. Now, as I write this introduction early on in the invasion of Ukraine, approximately 800 people are hiding in several rust splotched Soviet era bomb shelters underneath the Azot chemical factory in Siverondonetsk, one of the last cities to hold out in Lugansk, which is being devastated right now by Russia, Russian missile attacks. Since Putin's invasion of Ukraine, Millions of innocent Ukrainians have been uprooted from their homes. Thousands of civilians have been killed and injured. And each day, more than 100 Ukrainian soldiers are killed in battle. The war has precipitated a global food crisis that will affect millions, and famine threatens wide swaths of the world. In America, and I use the term America almost as a, you know, I, I, I understand that term is problematic in and of itself. It's a, it's a term with, that's, that's greatly freighted with, uh, with um, you know, colonial meanings. I, I, I understand that, you know, there's Latin America and there's North America. So I'm using the term America to refer specifically to North America. But I wanted it to, uh, to resonate with uh, the majority of Americans right now that are perplexed and um, confused about this war. So in America, North America, the Biden administration has committed to sending medium range missiles to Ukraine to help in its defenses against continuous Russian bombardment. Since the first week of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, I've been publishing reflections in the form of very short essays for a journal in New Zealand named Pesa Agora. The editor, Sean, Sturm would post the essay just shortly after receiving it and would patiently endure all my last minute corrections and changes. So I wrote these, these essays very quickly um, and uh, they were published almost immediately. That has its uh, advantages and also has its disadvantages. I understand that. Given the time differences, there was a relatively small window to work. Fearing the worst, I wanted to get out as many articles as I could so they could be of use in discussions among students and teachers uh, and other readers. Most of my references uh, originally appeared as hyperlinks, right? Um, and so transferring the hyperlinks into references was something I was unable to do, but if people are interested in the original um, if they're interested in the original um, reference, uh, references, they could actually go to the go to Pesa Agora and find them in my in my um, original essays. Um, well, as far as the invasion was concerned, I was learning a lot as I was writing. I've left some of my fluctuations, my qualifications intact in the book. I've altered some of my original reflections in hindsight. So if you go to the original article and you read the book, you might find some disparity there. As a fierce critic of fascism, whether of the traditional or Donald Trump variants, I was very disturbed by stories surrounding the Azov Battalion and its Nazi ideology. But when I came to understand that the Azov Battalion was not representative of the Ukrainian people as a whole, I was able to temper those concerns and express my views more freely in support of Ukraine, even as I was being scalded with opprobrium by some ultra leftist Putin supporters. So, um, you know, just it, to give you an overview, um, 
I try in this book to be highly critical of U.S. imperialism, U.S. foreign policy, uh, and I'm very, very critical of the Putin regime and Russia and its invasion of Ukraine, and I'm very supportive of Ukraine. I stand in support of Ukraine, and I want to explain why that's the case, and I will do that throughout this brief uh, talk. Um, at the same time, I'm highly critical of fascist elements in, that you can find in Ukraine, that you can find in Estados Unidos, that you can find in Russia, right? They're very prevalent in all three countries, so I'm very critical. But at the same time, I do stand in support of Ukraine. My first major concern was nuclear strikes escalating into some kind of World War III. And I've not ruled out this by any means. I've not ruled out the possibility of nuclear war uh, and, uh, you know, involving China, involving Russia, involving the United States. Uh, now, I felt Ukraine initially should maybe just cede some territory uh, because I was very concerned about just uh, Russia moving into Ukraine and simply taking it over and obliterating it. Um, and, uh, but I've changed my position on that somewhat. I'll try to explain that briefly. Um, I felt that Ukraine should cede some territory, leave Crimea alone, both, but at the same time, I was ignoring the fact that the seizure of Crimea was a patent violation of the Budapest Accords of 1994, whereby Ukraine turned over its nuclear weapons to Russia in exchange for a commitment from Russia that it would never attack Ukraine. And of course, I was disregarding the fact that Crimea had been a part of Ukraine since 1954. And I was hoping that, that uh, Ukraine and Russia would negotiate, both negotiate for some kind of peace. And my fear was, of course, of the ru mighty Russian military machine. Uh, but then again, at the same time, I recognize Putin's imperial ambitions need to be stopped. European unity must hold and preferably become autonomous from that of the United States. So I'm really trying to do a number of things. I don't agree with campism. There's a tendency of the left to basically uh, support uh, or tendency not to support any country that the United States supports. So for instance, oh, the US is sending, uh, sending armaments to Ukraine, therefore we have to be against Ukraine because the US is supporting them. I do not agree with that position. I think that you can, you can support Ukraine, you can be against US imperialist adventurism, and at the same time, you can be against Putin's invasion, illegal and horrific invasion of a sovereign country. So I think you can, you know, chew gum and juggle at the same time. So I've taken a, 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 a I've taken a position that's um, complicated, but I think it's a, a position that merits some serious consideration. Right. So I've taken a position that strongly supports Ukraine, that is highly critical of both the United States and NATO and Russia. Putin's desire to restore Russia as an imperial power became increasingly clear to me as he compared himself to 18th century Tsar Peter the Great in a series of remarks to a group of young Russian entrepreneurs while his troops were shelling cities in East Ukraine, pounding them into rubble. Right. And uh, I you know, have presented some of the excerpts from Putin's speech where he makes you know, that comparison between himself and Peter the Great. 
Now, since the invasion of Ukraine has strong religious implications, I've included in one of the final essays of my book, a discussion of St. Oscar Romero and his role in the struggle to make liberation theology a viable approach in working for peace through a faith-centered struggle in various arenas and theaters of armed conflict. And of course, Romero's case was El Salvador of the 1970s. And so I'm sort of positioning liberation theology, which was uh, you know, attacked by John Paul II, was attacked by the US military, right? Um, but it's still practiced by certain factions of the Catholic left. Hopefully it'll be growing in strength in years to come. Uh, there's no guarantee that's going to happen, but that certainly is a hope of mine. Um, and so uh, I take liberation theology and I put it, I position it against um, um, the patriarch, Kirill, of Russia who heads the Russian Orthodox Church. And uh, it's amazing uh, that the Russian Orthodox Church has a number of followers among the right wing here in Estados Unidos. Uh, they like Putin because they like Putin's stand against gay and lesbian and transgender people. They like Putin's um, you know, traditionalism. Uh, they like Putin's, you know, uh, form of conservative nationalism, right? Uh, I, I call it a toxic nationalism, and that's why they like Putin, and that's why many people have joined the uh, Russian Orthodox Church who he live here in the United States. Um, and I, my view of the United States is that it's going to become more and more like Viktor Orban, uh, Hungary, you know, Orban now is, uh, Viktor Orban is a leader that uh, is just loved and nearly worshipped uh, by the, uh, the Christian right-wing conservatives, the, what, who call themselves national conservatives here in the United States. And they're pushing for a uh, U.S. government that mirrors more and more uh, Victor Orban's brand of uh, fascism. Some people call it uh, soft fascism, but I just like to use the term fascism. He served as prime minister of Hungary since what, about uh, 2010. So if Americans or people in the United States want to know what kind of governance model the Republicans are aiming for with the resurrection of the chosen one, Donald Trump, then have a close look at Orban and how politics work in Hungary, and you will be seeing the future of the United States. Uh, and of course, I get into uh, issues uh, affecting the United States. Um, you know, um, you know the 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 attack on women, the control of women's bodies, the the uh, the you know the basically the over overturning Roe and, and Wade in the Supreme Court and outlawing abortions and um and i talk an awful lot about uh, what's happening in the educational context where uh, the the history of the united states now uh, must be taught in certain ways and cannot talk about uh cannot talk about systemic racism it cannot talk uh you know teachers are, are not permitted to talk uh, about slavery except in very superficial ways um, they are, uh, and that the United States must be presented in, in, in as, as a great beacon of light and a democracy and hope and freedom for the world's people, or else teachers may lose their jobs and they may even be sued by parents and not only lose their jobs, but uh, lose a lot of money through lawsuits. And I talk about an awful lot about that too. That to me seems... Um, you know, very fascistic. And so I spend quite a considerable amount of, of uh, time talking about the, the move of the United States towards fascist governments. Um, so the book is best thought of as a series of critical reflections. It's not a full-bodied history of the war uh, to date. 
So I basically use the metaphor of war to raise serious concerns that include the, the uh, imperialist war on national sovereignty, the Republican QAnon war on democracy. QAnon, of course, being the great conspiracy theory that's, that's taking over you know, um, many sectors of, of the United States among Trump supporters who believe that the Democratic Party are pedophiles, uh, they're shape-shifting aliens uh, who, um, who kill babies and drink their blood, uh, literally. I mean, this conspiracy theory gets crazy, and there are elected officials in the U.S. government that follow these conspiracies. Cool. Um, while war is raging, all we can really do right now at this point is ask questions the answers of which are impossible to know definitively, since that is the process that cultivates the ground of knowing, the ground needed for growing peace, peace which can only truly come through dialogical understanding, with unchaining the dialectic of self-becoming. Asking questions is itself an answer, which must be further contemplated at critical turning points in our history, war being among the most critical. And so I talk about the United States as a country heading for disaster, possibly even for civil war. We've fallen out of orbit in this country. The arc of social dreaming has shifted. And um, I talk about the battlefields, the cultural battlefields here in the United States and the actual you know, material battlefields that are happening now in Ukraine. Um, so uh, just to get get you a little bit more of a context of how I look about how I look upon the uh, the war I'll just give you I'll sort of flesh out a little bit my position paper a little bit so I support the Ukrainian people in the, their fight against Russian domination is it imperialist domination of course there's a big debate and you know among the left of whether Russia is an imperialist country um, I do call it imperialist uh, domination uh, and Russia's flagrant violation of international law and the UN Charter. I'm well aware the United States has, you know, violated the, 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 the statutes uh, um, countless times, right? I'm not, you know, by, by condemning Russia, I'm also, you know, acknowledging the problem here in the United States. Um, but in a recent article in, in, a, in a journal, Dan Labotz affirms the importance that Marx placed on supporting the right of countries to struggle for self-determination and independence. Marx affirmed this principle in his support for Poland in its various struggles with Prussia, Austria, and of course, Russia. Marx supported the right of Irish independence from the British Empire. He famously called upon British workers to support Irish independence. Marx supported the struggle for socialism in France and fervently backed the Paris Commune in 1871. Uh, during the US Civil War, Marx convinced the, interna the international to support the United States blockade of Confederate ports to keep cotton from being shipped to England's textile mills. Uh, he also condemned slavery, even writing to U.S. President Abraham Lincoln to that effect. So Marx was a strong critic of Russian imperialism in Eastern Europe. Yes, at one point, Marx considered the spread. So I believe Marx would, would have been a strong crit critic of Russian imperialism in, in, in Eastern Europe. Right? I, I, I believe that would be Marx's position were he uh, alive today. Um, yeah, at one point, Marx considered the spread of capitalism to Asia, Africa, and Latin America to be a good thing because, as Labatt's notes, it might make possible the development of a more productive capitalist economies that could create the abundance that is necessary to establish socialism. End of quotation. But later, Marx became a strong opponent of European imperialism, identifying with the struggles of the colonial people. So, yes. It is in the spirit of Marx's world historical support for national sovereignty and self-determination 
that I can unhesitatingly support the people of Ukraine in the resistance to the Russian invasion of their homeland. As Shulman and Labatz maintain in their important article against campism in the journal Social Forum, socialists that include Karl Marx, Eugene Debs, Rosa Luxemburg, CLR James, had always foregrounded that workers in each country should support those in another in their struggles for democracy and social justice. It's also in the spirit of international working class solidarity and democratic socialist internationalism that I reject the inverted nationalism of the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And I support Ukraine against Russian aggression. So look, I can acknowledge the wariness sown in the Russian state after NATO's dangerous incursion into Eastern Europe and the Baltics since 1991, in clear violation of a, of a commitment given to Russia's leaders as the Soviet Union was crumbling into a dark vortex of disassembly. Sure, this incursion on the part of NATO was a great tragedy and a great crime. But there, but there was also a violation of trust sown in Ukraine after Yeltsin signed the Budapest Memorandum in 1994, along with the US and Britain, but failed to respect Ukraine's territorial integrity in return for Ukraine's agreement to give up its nuclear arsenal. At that time, it was the largest, third largest actually, in the world. So by 1996, Ukraine became one of the only countries in the world to relinquish its nu nuclear weapons. So is it not accurate to describe Russia's imposed annexation of Crimea and menacing threats against Eastern Ukraine as acts of imperial aggression on the part of a fascist leader enticed by the withering siren song of neo-Stalinism? Well, this is a question that I wanted to pose to my students and my friends and comrades. Now, we need to be clear that this war was not unprovoked. It was provoked. Ukraine has been a de facto NATO ally for years. Its military has been trained by the US and other NATO allies, including, you know, soldiers from Mi Pais Natal, Canada, right? For a considerable length of time. The relationship between the US and Ukraine did indeed threaten Russian security, yeah. I don't think Putin is simply a crazy psychopath with a singular penchant for destroying Ukrainian cities and towns, no. But to say the war was provoked does not mean the war is justified. It clearly is not, in my estimation. Um, and it doesn't mean, by the way, that Putin does not have imperial ambitions. I believe he does. Ukraine was not planning a military strike against Russia. Ukraine wants to be, wanted, wants to be part of the European Union. It was building up its defensive capabilities, anticipating a Russian military offensive designed to smash its aspirations for democracy. Now, we have to hear many sides of this story. We need to hear from media outlets that have been discredited by the mainstream. We need to hear from left media outlets, often in conflict with each other, that deserve to be heard. To shut them down is no way to move ahead with a critical approach to understanding the war and the politics of war and peace. And there are causes to this war. That said, I clearly support Ukraine and its right to defend itself on the battlefield. And for that, it needs weapons provided by the West. This war could have been stopped, of course, before it began. Whether it was the US who prevented the war from being settled peacefully is a debate that will linger for decades. We need to have these debates. We need to bring all our efforts to bear on finding a peaceful settlement, of course. I raise many questions in this book as a way to provoke debate, but it's clear that I support Ukraine's battle for sovereignty. I do not believe Putin's invasion is simply for defensive purposes. This book goes to great lengths in criticizing Putin's professed reasons for, ing uh, for invading Ukraine and providing reasons for why Ukraine needs Western armaments to defend itself on the battlefield. So I stand with Ukraine. Is Putin's goal to reclaim parts of the lost Soviet Union by invoking in speeches the great patriotic war against the German Reich? Or does he want to travel deeper into historical time beyond the founding of Moscow 
and reconstitute the Russian Empire by taking back what he believes to be Russian land and setting up independent fiefdoms loyal to Russia, such as the Russian-controlled Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics. Well, let's talk about that. Let's have a debate. Um, Vladimir Putin, ruler of Eurasia, that has a ring to it. Sounds like the kind of nationalism that comes from a long history of czarist rule. Um, but it would be inc inconceivable for Putin to try to integrate Eurasia into its sphere of influence without Ukraine because of the importance of the city of Kyiv to Russian nationalist mythology. Russia already has the Belarusians under its iron thumb, but needs Ukraine turned into a federalized state in order to firm up the idea of Russia as a unity of three Eastern Slavic peoples. <coughs> Does this form a KGB Slavophile propped up behind a cartoonish white topped oval table made from a single 20 foot long sheet of beech wood? Does this man loathe Ukrainian sovereignty to the extent that he is willing to engage in a decades long war of attrition in order to amalgamate this pan-Slavic empire? Well, here's a question. Let's raise it. Putin is searching for his legacy. That much seems clear. Would a Russian victory invigorate autocrats and fascist leaders, including Donald Trump, who decry liberalism and celebrate the persistent downturn of Western democracy, which they see as ineffectual and weak? We don't know the answers to these questions. We don't know, but we need to raise them. Should Ukraine have happily joined the Eurasian Economic Union? The Euro maiden revolution of dignity gave us the answers to those questions. Sadly, some US leftists are arguing that the maiden revolution was a US coup carried out by the US against a democratically elected government. I disagree, and I agree with Slavoj Žižek that maiden was an authentic popular vote, right? So that sort of gives you a, 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 a bit of an overview of, of the book. Um, and uh, I have, you know, various chapters here. Um, the, the ones that, that most reflect um, America Latina are, are the ones that involve liberation theology. Um, and, um, and uh, I, so I do explore the sort of religious dimensions of this war. And I also uh, break down some of Putin's leading philosophers, such as, as, as Alexander Dugan and others. And I give a, a kind of uh, a breakdown of their fi philosophical justification for war. Uh, I critique, um, I, do a, I do a whole debate uh, around Stalin versus Lenin uh, and, uh, and try to um, argue, of course, it's pretty clear that Putin is much is much more in common with Stalin than Lenin, at least in the question of Ukraine. Uh, and, uh, you know, Putin blames Lenin. I mean, I mean, uh, uh, Putin doesn't even consider Ukraine as, 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 as an authentic uh, country. And I take that idea and I critique it. And um, I critique Putin's uh, notion that Ukraine needs to be denazified arguing that, that uh, you know, if, if we're looking for fascist or neo-Nazi elements, um, we need look no further than Russia. And I, and, and I, I make that claim by uh, analyzing uh, some of the uh, philosophers that have been quoted um, by Putin, Dugan and others, of course. So that's about it. I don't want to go on too much further. Uh, all my uh, all the royalties that I get from this book are going to go to uh, support uh, Ukraine, the people of Ukraine. Um, I do 
address the issue, of course, uh, and I think I mentioned this of, of um, you know, neo the, 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 the new right and neo Nazi elements. I do critique it, I critique it historically. My, and I'll just end by saying, you know, what personally motivated me um, to write this book. So my, um, I grew up in a very conservative family in Toronto, Canada, uh, a, a working class family, and eventually, eventually we made it into the, uh, into the lower middle class. Um, uh, when my dad uh, got a job with, uh, with um, Philips Electronic uh, firm, which is based in Eindhoven. Um, and, um, and my dad in 1939 joined the Royal Canadian Engineers in 1939 and went to fight the Nazis. He fought in Italy. He fought, uh, he fought, you know, in, in, uh, in Holland, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, the Canadians helped liberate that, uh, that part of, of Europe during the Second World War. And uh, he came back um, and would share, and he was away actually for, he left for six years. He was in the trenches and the, in, the, in building the bridges and, and, uh, and fighting the Nazis for six years. My uncle, who was very much a part of our family, he went and joined the Royal Navy in England and he uh, flew one of those planes with the two wings, biplanes, um, off uh, the, the, uh, the British uh, battleship uh, Ark Royal. And uh, he was credited with putting the uh, torpedo in the German battleship Bismarck. And he received the Distinguished Service Medal that was pinned on him by King George. Um, the king that uh, had the speech impediment, the one they made the movie about, um, and he was a he was a, a, a war hero, and there was a stamp that commemorated my uncle, Canadian stamp, uh, for his um, his bravery in fighting uh, the Nazis, and uh, he, also he fought in the war in the Pacific against the Japanese, and so. Um, growing up, all I heard were stories about the Second World War. And, uh, and, uh, and my dad was, was very, very much anti-fascist. Uh, he was conservative, but he was anti-fascist. And so um, he would share with me as I was growing up all these stories, and so would my uncle, and, um, you know, newspaper clippings and, and, uh, and stories around the, the dinner table permeated my, <clears throat> my youth in growing up. And so I've <clears throat> always been very, very concerned about fascism. Uh, and I see it happening here in the United States. And, um, and of course, it, and historically, of course, I've, I've written about fascism, I've written, I've condemned, you know, um, the, the anti-Semitism, anti I've been very much um, a student of, of the Holocaust, um, and uh, I've seen what fascism can do, and the horrors it, it can bring about, um, and um, and so when the invasion of Ukraine began, I, I began to look at the history of Ukraine uh, and some of the some of the the, the horrors that occurred during that history and the history, of course, of, of, uh, of Soviet Union. Um, and of course, I've always been very much a student of the, of, of the history of North America. And since 1975, when I moved to the United States and became a dual citizen, um, I've been very, very much interested in and in, in fixated in, in a way on the history of the United States and US politics. And of course, I've been very concerned about the rise of fascism here and, uh, and the rise of anti-Semitism, the rise of racism, the, uh, just the, 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 the pervasive violence that we're seeing now in this country. And I speak a lot about that in this book as well as 
focusing on the war in Ukraine. Thanks very much for listening to me. And uh, thank you, Luis, again, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Take care.